the shadows, bow for the gallows. A dead man walking, so love came calling. Rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up. Six feet under, I thought it was over. And answered a prayer, the voice of a savior. Rise up. Welcome. Uh, really glad that you're joining us again online. If this is your very first time, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Joel. I am one of the pastors here at uh, the church. It's always great to be able to connect this way. So just want to give you a, a bit of an update in terms of what is happening around here this Christmas season. On December the 24th, Christmas Eve, we're going to have a service both in person but also posted uh, online. And so if you want to join us in person or online, uh, we're going to be able to connect with you. Then the following day, Christmas Day, we're going to be online only. Then on January the 1st, we're going to go back to in-person and online. And so we hope that you'll stay connected with us during this Christmas season. As we get to the towards Christmas and we, we think of end of year, I just want to say thank you for the way that so many of you have supported this church financially. Uh, without your generosity, without your contributions, uh, we could not do anything that we do. And we're seeing an impact both in our community and other communities because of your giving and the chance to be on Line. If you would like to make uh, an end of the year gift, um, one of the best ways to do that is online. You can send an e-transfer to finance at parispresb.ca and uh, we will uh, be in touch with you. And so thank you for the way you continue to uh, support this church. We're excited about what God is doing. We're looking forward to 2023. Uh, we have some exciting updates. We have a new sermon series that is going to be starting on January the 15th. More details uh, to come. And so listen, if, if you're not getting our weekly e-blast, um, can I suggest jumping on our website, signing up? There's a button to click. It takes about 15 seconds. It keeps you connected to everything that we are doing throughout the week. And so maybe that is your next step. Well, this week is going to be something slightly different. We're going to Q&A. And so I'm going to take a, a few minutes to, to answer some of the questions that you have been asking. Uh, but before we jump into that and some music, let me just pray for you uh, where you are at today. And so, Lord God, we just... Give thanks for this day, this chance to gather together um, online. And I pray specifically for those people uh, at home, wherever they may be, whoever they may be with. May they know that they are loved by you, that, that you matter to them. And I just ask that in the midst of this time together, that they would encounter you in a very personal and specific way. For this we ask Jesus in your name. Amen.
This week we're doing Q&A and it's kind of a new tradition that we've started and it's a chance for you to ask questions and for me to uh, respond. And I think questions are so important in life, but especially when it comes to faith and our following of Jesus. It's often one of the ways that we grow. It's one of the ways that, that, that we learn. And so it's always the place of in the midst of our questions, are we stepping closer and closer uh, to Jesus? And so we're going to do this from time to time. And we want to include you, uh, those of you that are online. And so about a week ago, uh, I sent out an email and just kind of asked people, what are your questions? Like, what are the things that you are wondering about? And I got 20 responses. So don't worry, I'm not going to respond to all 20. But here's my promise to you. If you ever ask me a question, I may not get to it online or in person. But I promise that I'll respond to you personally, either through email or through a Zoom or, or through a phone call, what, whatever it takes, because this is important. And, and the, these are the questions that you are asking. Now, if you were going to join us in person, uh, I'm going to jump into it and take them live from the floor. And so I, had no, I have no idea what, what's going to come. And so as I thought about that, I was thinking, I want to respond to the questions that you've asked me online in somewhat similar fashion of, of just thinking it through and giving my first response. And so if you have further questions, if you want to follow up, understand, send me an email and I would love to have that conversation and just begin that dialogue uh, with you. One further comment. One of the things that's really cool is every question has a bit of a backstory to it. And so I'm going to do kind of the best that I can to, to give you a little bit of the backstory with still keeping uh, people's uh, anonymous as, as some of them have, have asked. So, so very first question that came in and I'm going to handle this one live as well because that's just kind of a cool thing to give you a little bit of insight into my life and my family. The question is this, what are some of your Christmas traditions. Uh, we all have traditions. We all do different things. And there's one particular one that actually was started by Rebecca, my wife, a number of years ago. A lot of us have the tradition of sending people Christmas cards or Christmas letters, just ways to keep updated. And so what we've started to do is as the cards come in, we of course display them prominently throughout the house. But then after Christmas, we gather them all up. And every night when we meet as a family, we take one card, we read it, we think about the family or the people who sent it, and then we pray for them. And so here's the deal. If you send the Sherbonos a Christmas card, we will pray for you in the new year. 
No Christmas card, no prayer. That, that's kind of how we roll. Great, great question. Second question uh, actually came from uh, one of the youth in our church, and I love it. I love it. In, in, in our Sunday morning live, our kids' ministry, they're asking questions. They're having great discussions. It's, it's all about asking important and good questions. So this is the question that, that was asked. Who did Cain and Abel marry? Not sure how familiar with the story, but the very beginning in the book of Genesis, we have Adam and we have Eve, and they had two sons, Cain and Abel, and they ended up getting a major dispute. Um, Cain was unhappy with Abel because his gift was recognized more than 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 his own to God, and so he killed Abel. So uh, Abel didn't marry anyone. Cain, on the other hand, who did Cain marry? Well, Genesis five verse four tells us that that Adam and Eve had other children. So, Cain likely married, not likely, he did marry a relative, either a sister or a niece. And you may think, well, wait a second, wait a second. That just seems kind of weird. But understand, it was both necessary and genetically safe at the time. Interesting, further down in the Bible, in Leviticus uh, chapter 18, is when God says, okay, enough of this. No more marrying your relatives because clearly the the, the it wasn't going to be good genetically anymore. And so simple answer, who did Cain marry? He, he would have married one of his uh, relatives. Third question. And this again comes from one of our youth. And this question came from a conversation that she had at school with, with someone else. They, they, they were asking her a question. And this is so cool because it means that she was talking about her faith and that people understand where she's coming from. And so this is a bit of a two-parter. So first question is this. Is there a limit to heaven? Like, is there a physical limit? And if not, then how will I be able to find family members while I am there? So let's deal with the first part first. Is there a limit to heaven physically? No. And I say that because of this. Heaven is not bound by time and space as we are. That that, that, that God is beyond time and space and space. And so when we think of heaven, when we think of eternity, this is going to be the reality. One of the things about heaven is that the Bible, God, as he speaks through people, is is, is trying to give us images that we would understand to to help us grasp the majesty of what, what it's going to be. But it's not necessarily going to be exactly like that. Let me give you two examples. In John chapter 14, Jesus speaks about eternal life, about being my father's house. He says, in my father's house, there are many rooms. And so we often have this picture of a mansion or a big house. Is heaven going to be an actual house? I'm not convinced it is, but what is it going to be like? It's going to be about relationships. It's going to be a community. It's going to be about being together with God. Second image is found in Revelation 21, where it talks about, and there'll be no more sea. I know people who love the sea, who love the ocean, who love the fish. Like, wait a second, wait a second. What what is that all about? Understand in the ancient world, the sea was often um, attributed to the fact where there would be danger, where there would be uncertainty, where there would be the unknown. And so God is saying, listen, in heaven, there's going to be no uncertainty. There's going to be no worry. It's all going to be understood. And so, so heaven is not bound by time and space. And so the next question then is, well, well, will I be able to find my friends and family there? Will I just be wandering forever? And, and again, the answer is no. We're, we're reminded that, that when we put our faith in Jesus, we will be there and we'll be with those with whom we know and with whom we love. There's this, there's this great verse in the Old Testament in 2 Samuel 12, 23, and it's King David referencing when his infant child has died. And there's great grief and there's great mourning but there's a sense of comfort when he says this, I will go to him, but he will not return to me. It's, it's David being enlightened in the fact that, that he'll be united with his son once again. And oftentimes that's an incredible hope for us in, in the midst of death, of knowing that those with whom we love, who have put their faith in Jesus, we'll be with them in all of eternity. Okay. Okay. Fourth question. We're, uh, we're kind of clicking along here. Um, fourth question is this, and this has come from someone who watches us online, has never been with us in person, which again is just so cool the way that we're able to connect with one another. This is someone who has been experiencing just the transforming work of, of the Holy Spirit in, in her life and in such a way that she's wanting to share her faith with others. 
So awesome. And so her question is specifically this. He says, how can I be encouraged to spread the word of Jesus without becoming defensive when some people have so much hostility for Christians? Great question. Great questions. I, I think for a lot of us, sometimes we struggle with just even sharing our faith. And so how do we share our faith with, with people who sometimes are hostile, with sometimes people who are angry and, and kind of come almost at attack mode? A couple of thoughts here. The first one is I always say, start with where people are at. And so if they're angry, if they're hostile, if they're upset, dig in a little bit. Ask them, why is it? Is it because of something that is said in the Bible? Likely they're hostile because of something that has happened to them. Maybe a person who said they were a follower of Jesus has just treated them in a horrible way, or maybe they've had a terrible church experience, whatever it may be, or maybe they've seen some of the, the injustices that, that have happened within the church. And so start with where they are at. Begin the conversation. Second thing is always understand what is as important as what we share with them is our posture towards them. That, that, that we need not to be hostile. We don't, we don't respond with an argument. We don't respond with, with anger. In the early church, they faced this all the time. There was incredible hostility towards the movement of Jesus. So much so that they'd be mocked, they'd be scorned, they, they would be treated horribly. And so this was something the early church had to deal with. And so the Apostle Peter, one of the great leaders, in speaking to a group of Christians, he said these words, words that I believe are so applicable to us. In 1 Peter 3, 15 to 16, he says this, In your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. And so Peter's like, listen, if you want to talk to people about your faith, you know, be prepared. And then he says this, but do this with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. In any conversation I go into, regardless of how the other person is acting, I want to act in a way that displays the reality of Jesus in my life. And I have learned over and over again that you don't argue anyone into the kingdom of God. So, so start with where they're at. Create a, a posture of gentleness and respect. And then the third one is understand there's some conversations that you just need to step out of. Uh, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, and I get to use it here, is in Matthew 7, verse 6, when Jesus says this, don't throw your pearls to the pigs. Like, what, what the heck is Jesus talking about? Jesus is talking about the fact that there's going to be times where People don't want to hear the good news that comes through knowing him. And so sometimes we just exit conversations. We, we see Jesus doing this all the time. When people would come up and get all up in his face, if Jesus felt that they weren't honestly seeking, he would just exit the conversation. And, and I think the same thing is true for us, is that when people come towards us, we, we can start with where they're at. We can respond with a sense of gentleness and respect. But understand, listen, hey, if people are just wanting to pick a fight, get into an argument with you, sometimes the best thing we can do is just slowly step out of the conversation. All right, last question. Again, this is from uh, a couple that has just started coming to our church, uh, and it's just great to see new people engaging with us in this way. The question is this, is why do wicked, the wicked prosper growing old and increasing in power? That's actually a quote from the book of Job in the Old Testament. And it's the question of this is like, why is it that in this world, or maybe even within our sphere of influence, we see people who are evil, we see people who are corrupt, just seemingly becoming more and more powerful and successful. And listen, this, this is not only a struggle for us today. I mean, when we see some of the terrible things that are happening around the world, we're like, like God, why, why are you allowing this evil to take place? But it's a problem that has happened throughout the history of time. We, we see it over and over again. We, we, we see the struggle of the early church. I mean, they must have wondered, like, like God, why are you allowing the, 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 the evilness of the Roman Empire to take control over us? You jump all the way back into the Old Testament and, and the people of Israel could be like, why are you allowing the, the, the Babylonians to rule over us? Like, what is the deal with all of this? When you start to read the Bible, 
you realize that there was never a period of time where there wasn't the reality of evil empires at work. And so what is the deal with this? A couple of thoughts. First one is this, is that it shows the reality of the brokenness of our world because of sin. There's, there's a tension we hold on to. One is the sovereignty of God, that God is in control, that God has a plan, and that ultimately God's will will be done, along with the gift of free will, that, that we are not robots, that we have choices to either choose the ways of God or to not. And evil in this world shows what happens, both individually, personally, but then also corporately, what happens when we fail to go in the ways of God we see how evil begins to prevail. But in the midst of it, we continue to remember that God is in control, even in the midst of the darkness. One of the great books in the Bible that talks about this is the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, where, where Babylon has basically taken over. They've taken over the Israelites. They, they've brought them out of their nation and they're, they're just trying to completely annihilate them. And here is Daniel along with some others who are faithful to God, who are almost asking the question, like, what is the deal? And God reminds Daniel and his nation a number of times of, listen, empires will rise and empires will fall, but the kingdom of God will remain forever. And that's the final thing. That's the final place that we land is understand that there will be ultimate judgment one day when Jesus returns again. And the hope that we have, the message is that God is in control. And so will we put our trust in him? So that's where we're going to wrap up today. Great questions. Keep the questions coming. If you have want to follow up on some of the things that I've talked about or, or maybe you have other questions, I would love, love to hear from you. But understand this. Questioning is a part of growing in our faith. And so keep them coming. One of the great steps, maybe get around some other people and, and start asking, like, like, what does this look like in your life? And what is your question? Because oftentimes, the very questions that we are wondering about Others around the table are wondering the exact same thing. So really glad you joined us this week. Look forward to having you join us as we continue into this Christmas season. But, but before I, I shudder down here, let me just pray for you and the situation that, that you may be facing. Let's, let's pray together. So Lord God, we give you thanks for this day. We give thanks for the way that you work in our lives. We give you thanks that you are ultimately God of all truth. And so I pray for those that are watching today. I, I, I pray that that in the midst of their questions, that, that you would be able to surround them with people or with just reminders of your truth. And so we give you thanks for this day. For we ask it all, Jesus, in your name. Amen. And so now may God bless you. May God watch over you. May you know that God walks with you today and into all of your tomorrows. Amen.